Well, we're back in Daniel's gospel or Daniel's uh, prophecy. So turn with me to chapter 11. We started there last week, if you remember. And uh, who can give us a summation of what we learned in the first 35 verses? Roger, go ahead. Antiochus Epiphanes. Yeah, that guy. Yeah, that guy. <laughs> so you had the kings of the north, and who were they? Do you remember? Yes. They were the uh, Seleucids. The Seleucids. And then you had the kings of the south, Seleucids being Assyria in that area. Uh, and then you had the kings of the south being the area of Egypt, and they were what group? The Ptolemies, Ptolemies, right. And they were the two generals, two of the four generals that Alexander had in his charge and his army. When Alexander died as such a young man, you know, the Bible says that uh, it's easier for a warrior to take a city than control his own spirit. Is that true? Yeah, yeah and surely Alexander's an example of that, isn't he? A genius when it comes to military strategy, conquered the entire known world at 32 years old at an incredible rate of speed. He was a leopard, you know. Uh, but how did he die? Venereal disease and alcoholism. Could take the city, couldn't control his own spirit. Boy, it's a lesson for us, isn't it? Who alone can control the spirit of man? Who alone can take your heart, your hard-heartedness, your rebellious, self-governing, desiring heart, and change it? Only God. He makes that transformation in our heart. But what's required of us? Simply to yield and surrender, right? Daniel's a wonderful example of that, isn't he? Well out into his old age, he was a statesman in the kingdom of Babylon and then in the Medo-Persian kingdom for how many years? Well, over 60 years. 60 years he was a statesman. And now he's at the end of his life. And we said in the first six chapters of the book, he was interpreting dreams and visions that others had, Nebuchadnezzar in particular, and then his grandson, Belteshazzar. And then from chapter 7 to the end of the book, he has dreams and visions of his own that God is giving him and go way out into the future. But in the near fulfillment of these things, he didn't see that. The only thing he saw was the rise of the Babylonian Empire. And then he saw the rise of the Medo-Persian Empire when they came to power. But the rest of all that he had prophesied was yet future for him. But now as we're here in chapter 11, and we ended in verse 35, all that he has said has already come to be, as far as we're concerned, all of these things have happened already, haven't they? As we look back on it. And it was amazing as we looked at those first 35 verses in chapter 11, how absolutely precise, how exact he was in the prophecies that he was given with regard to these succeeding kingdoms that would come, the Seleucids and the Ptolemies and the war that would take place, Israel being that buffer zone in the middle and getting knocked back and forth when one would rise over the other. Very much what happened in the time of Jesus, right? We talked about that. There were two major empires, one in the west, one in the east. And who were they? Rome and the Parthian Empire. There was a Roman Empire, the Parthian Empire, and they were constantly battling out. And the buffer zone in between was the area of the Middle East, Israel, Jordan, Syria, that area there. And so when one would conquer over the other short term, they were not a complete conquering over, but at least maintain that territory, that buffer zone. And then they'd be pushed back and they'd be pushed back. And poor Israel, poor Syria, poor Israel those folks in the middle, they would suffer tremendously for it. That's why there was such a concern among all of Jerusalem when the wise men made a border incursion. Why? They were Parthian. And it wasn't three men on camels with a small contingent of people. There would have been a, quite a sizable group of people making this border incursion. And we don't know how many wise men there were. We just say three. Why? Because of three gifts. Yeah. But where'd they come from? They, they came a long way, 600 miles. They, they came from Babylon. But, but specifically, who influenced these men? That they would be seeking a king who would be born, the king of Israel. Daniel, the cult of Daniel. And I didn't mean cult in a good sense, not in a negative or a bad sense. They were called the kingmakers of Persia. And that's why Herod was so concerned and all of Jerusalem with him. Thinking, oh, here we go again. Another battle between the Parthians and the Romans. It was a one... A one 
time when Herod was controlling that area of Judea under the uh, leadership or under the authority of Rome, the Parthians did come in and pushed him out for a while where he had to leave. But then he came back. So that's what they were concerned about. So much like these kings in the north, kings of the south, the Seleucids and the Ptolemies going back and forth in their struggle. But then there was this monster of a man who was a type of the Antichrist. And what was his name? Antiochus Epiphanes. Yeah? The madman, they called him, right? But he gave himself the name Epiphanes. Why? Meaning the glorious one, or the illustrious one, right? And so the play on words, he, they said he is Antiochus Menopides, which he means the madman, the madman. But nonetheless, he was the one who uh, went into the temple, into the Holy of Holies of temple, uh, after he was humiliated by the Romans. And we went through all of this last time we were together, remember? That Roman admiral had such chutzpah. He had a very small contingent, a naval force, that could have easily been overwhelmed by Antiochus and his army. But Antiochus understood that if he did that, he was declaring war with Rome, and he could not defeat Rome. And so the general gave him an amount of time to make his decision one way or another. You're going to retreat, or are we going to do battle now? And Antiochus said, well, just give me a little bit of time. And what did the general do? What did the admiral do? Sure. Drew his sword, drew a circle around him, and said, yeah, take all the time you need, but before you leave the circle, give me your decision. So he was humiliated before his men. And he went back home in a rage, and who did he take it out on? On the Jews, on the Jews. Mm. Anti-Semitism is historic, isn't it? What people group on the face of the earth has been persecuted more than the Jews? And we're going to read here that the worst is yet to come. Hmm. Nonetheless, Antiochus is a type of the man we're going to read about now. He's a type of the Antichrist. When he was taking his vengeance and his wrath out upon the Jews, he was preventing them from worshiping at the temple. As a matter of fact, he went into the temple and he desecrated it. He desecrated it by sacrificing a pig to Zeus right in the Holy of Holies. Well, then you had the period of the Maccabeans where they cleansed the temple and restored worship to God once again. <clears throat> the tragic aspect of all of this is that we know that the Shekinah, the Shekinah glory of God, left the temple long before this. When did the presence of God leave the temple? Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 11. We're going to go to Ezekiel next after we finish Daniel, possibly tonight. Um, but in Ezekiel chapter 11... Ezekiel sees the Shekinah, the Spirit of God, leave the temple. And this is just before the complete destruction of the temple in 586 B.C. When would the Lord return to the temple? The triumphal entry. Luke chapter 19. Jesus makes his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And even after all of those centuries of temple worship, yet the Lord wasn't in the temple. Claiming to go to the Lord's house, yet the Lord wasn't in the house. And they had no idea. Because they were so self-deceived, right? Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. That's what the Bible tells us. How many people are deceived today? Hearers only. Man, not doers. Many. Many. And the only person they're deceiving are themselves. Themselves. And such was that at the time of Christ when he came. Many deceivers. Uh, Jews in name only. Much like today, unfortunately, we have a lot of Christians in name only, but not truly in the surrender of their life, not in the possession of the Holy Spirit. Hmm? Well, in chapter 36, he's going to be talking about this willful king who would come, who Antiochus Epiphanes was a type of, and we call him the son of perdition or the Antichrist, right? And that's who he's talking about. He's going way out into the future now. He's the little horn in chapter 7, verse 8. Look at that for a minute. The little horn that was already prophesied that would come. Considering that fourth beast, which would be the revived Roman Empire. Uh, I know there's some today who theorize that the Antichrist is going to come out of a Muslim caliphate. No, 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 no. Uh, the prophecies are very specific of the kingdom, the world governing kingdoms that would come and the last one that was prophesied by either Nebuchadnezzar in his dream that was interpreted by Daniel or the visions and the dreams that Daniel got specifically would be the revived Roman Empire. It's not a Muslim caliphate. And that's what he's talking about here when he talks about this beast here in chapter 7 and verse 7. After this, after the Greek 
empire, which was uh, Alexander, and he was likened unto a leopard. I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It devoured, breaking pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the other beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little horn, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes, like the eyes of a man and a mouth, speaking pompous words. Now, this is the Antichrist. He comes in initially by, by election, by these ten kings agreeing that they're going to make him king of kings, <laughs> lord of lords, and he's going to demand that the world bow down and worship him eventually. Speaking of him... It says in verse 11, I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words with the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain, praise the Lord, and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beasts, they, didn't, they, did, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. So this was a prophecy concerning this man to come. If you look again at uh, chapter 9, He's mentioned in the interpretation of the vision that Gabriel gives, Daniel, of the 77s of Israel. And we understand what that prophecy is dealing with. It's dealing with them. The time that Artaxerxes gave the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, the temple, to the coming of the Messiah, the prince, there would be 69 seven-year periods, 483 years multiplied by a 360-day calendar because that's what they used. It comes to 173,880 days from the, com the command was given to the coming of the Messiah, the Prince. This is prophesied by Daniel. Every Jew should have known this prophecy that Daniel was giving of the precise coming of the Messiah to Israel. And when did that happen? Well, if you go to Luke chapter 19, you don't need to turn there now. We have the record of the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem where he declared, how is it that you didn't know this thy day? and the things that make for your peace. He was holding them accountable for knowing the time of his first coming. He holds the church accountable for knowing the season of his return, to be able to discern the times of the sign. Times, plural, sign, singular, or times, singular, times, uh, signs, plural, that we're in today. Do you understand? We're very, very close to the fulfillment of everything that the Bible speaks of more than any other. The time of the end, the last days, the latter times, the end of the age, the coming of the Messiah. Do you realize that? Do you believe that? Do you live like that? <laughs> yeah. Well, nonetheless, as we look at uh, chapter 9, speaking of this man, the Antichrist, verse 27, there's a gap of time between verse 26 and verse 27. Verse 26 ends the 69th seven-year period. It's the end of the 173,880 days. It says in verse 26, after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be caught up, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And that's the Romans under Titus Vespasian. And the end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the wars of desolation are determined. Now, now there's a gap in time between the end of verse 26 and the beginning of verse 27. What's that gap in time? 2,000 years, in which we call the, the church age. This is the church age. Now, you need to understand something. The major subject of Scripture is the Messiah, right? Number one major subject of Scripture is Messiah. What's the second major subject of the Scriptures? Israel. And God, the God of Israel, Hashem, right? He looks at all of human history in light of the way in which he's working providentially in the life of Israel and the Jewish people. So now there's one seven-year period yet to begin where God will once again be working on behalf of the Jewish people. As we've been going through the Gospel of John, at the end of chapter 12, what's ended? The public ministry of Jesus to Israel. It's over. Israel rejected him nationally. The national rejection of the Messiah has caused him to go back to the Father, to send the Holy Spirit, to awaken and bring birth to what? The church, the church age, the age of the Gentiles. Now, truly, the times of the Gentiles where Israel will be trodden underfoot began with the Babylonian conquest in 586 B.C. And it continues to this very day. When will it end? 
at the beginning of the 70th seven, where God is dealing directly with Israel once again. So between verse 26 and verse 27 of chapter 9 is this 2,000 year gap, which we call the church age. But in verse 27, as we approach the end of time, this man of sin, this son of perdition, who we call the Antichrist, why do we call him Antichrist? Because he's against Christ? He's a false Christ. He's a pseudo Christ. He claims to be the God of all gods. We'll see that in a moment. But in verse 27, it says, Then he, he, the Antichrist, shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. What's this covenant? And who's, who's he making the covenant with? Israel. For what purpose? Peace. If you go to Israel today and you talk to a ra- an Orthodox rabbi, they'll tell you they're waiting for Messiah. And the Messiah will be a man as Moses was a man. That's what they'll tell you. We're waiting for Messiah. We're waiting for the first coming of Messiah. But Messiah will be a man as Moses is a man. And the way we will know Messiah is he will allow us to rebuild the temple. Isn't that interesting? That's precisely the covenant that Antichrist makes with Israel, allowing them to rebuild their temple right there in the Temple Mount. Now, right now, the second most holy place for Islam is there, the Dome of the Rock. But that piece of real estate is the most sacred piece of real estate for the three monotheistic (laughs) religions of the world. What are they? Yeah, Christianity, Islam, and Hebraism, or Judaism, right? So what the Antichrist will allow the three major religions to do, because we're going to have a one-world religious system, all headed by him. We'll have a one-world political system, all headed by him. We'll have a one-world economic system, which he controls completely. We're marching to, listen to me, if you don't realize it, take your head out of the sand and look at what's going on globally, not just here, but in the globe, there is a march towards global communism. Do you understand that? Look what's happened to our neighbor to the north. It's insane. Look what's happened with Australia. It's become a prison island once again. You know, it's amazing, amazing. Hmm. But he'll make this covenant with Israel for one week, allowing, allowing the Muslims to worship on the Temple Mount on Friday. Friday, allowing the Jews to worship at the Temple Mount in their rebuilt temple on, and allowing the apostate church, led by the Catholic Church, I believe, and the false prophet, who is? The Pope. Yeah, no probability. I think that's a good interpretation. I could be wrong. Uh, You can correct me on the way up. But nonetheless, he is going to allow them to worship a false Christian God, right, (laughs) on the Temple Mount on Sunday. And this is the covenant that he makes. And he makes it with them for one week. What's a week? A heptad or a seven-year period, the last seven years. Now, in the middle of that week is when, look at what it says here. He shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offerings. And on the wings of abomination shall be one who makes desolation, even unto the consummation which is determined is poured out upon the desolate. So Jesus quotes this verse, doesn't he? He tells us when you see, speaking to the Jews, not to you and I, we won't be here to see this, but the Jews will be when Yom Kippur is fulfilled, when the Jews are awakened, right? What happens on the Feast of Trumpets? We're hopefully, we're gone. We're going to jump off the earth. You ready? <laughs> you got to practice. <laughs> feast of trumpets, we should be jumping off the earth. What happens on Yom Kippur, the next feast? The Day of Atonement. The Jews' eyes are opened. Paul would say, don't you know that blindness has happened in part temporarily to my people? Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, until the church age is over, is what Paul is talking about. He's right in line with what Daniel is writing here in chapter 9, the prophecy that he's interpreting through the angel Gabriel. The fullness of the Gentiles is when that last Gentile, whoever that is, finally surrenders their life to God. We're out of here. Our ticket is punched. Hello. Goodbye. (laughs) Oh, but then, then the spirit of supplication of grace. The Jews will be justified because they're going to come to faith in who Jesus really is. Not thinking he's a madman, not thinking he's some rebel, not thinking he's some, some crazed individual from Nazareth who has this messianic complex. No, they'll see Jesus for who he truly is. And they'll surrender. And they'll mourn and weep and say, where did you get these wounds in your hands? And he'll say, the house of my friends. Hmm? Yeah. 
Okay, so that's this man. We see him in chapter 7. We see him here in chapter 9. Go back to chapter 11, verse 36. Then the king, this Antichrist, shall do according to his own will. What's the uh, major message in the scripture is for us to yield, submit, submit, surrender ourselves, submit ourselves to the will of God. Isn't that right? The reason how you can determine if someone truly is a Christian or not is not what they say, right? Because we don't, we don't listen with our ears because our ears deceive us. We listen with our because you live what you believe. And so you're going to live a certain way if you're a Christian. What is way is that? It's the way of God. The way, the truth, and the life, right? The way is the way of love. Loving God, loving others, loving ourselves last, right? But if we truly love God, there's a lot of things we will not do. There's a lot of things we will do. But they're all determined by the will of our Father who we love. Hmm? Yeah. The Satanic Bible, written by Anton LaVey, the theme of the Satanic Bible can be summed up how? Do what thou wilt. Do whatever you want. When people do whatever they want, what happens? It causes destruction. You give your flesh its way in any area of your flesh, it's going to doom you, send you to destruction. And then when you begin to exercise your own will apart from God's will, apart from the right and wrong that you know that's already innate within you, there's this guilt and this shame that comes about. Hitler thought he could do away with the guilt and the shame, didn't he? What was he going to do? Get rid of those lawgivers. Get rid of the people of the book. Get rid of the Jews. You get rid of the Bible. You get rid of the moral law. You get rid of guilt and shame. The final solution. What's the problem? The problem for wicked people is guilt. Guilt and shame. What's the biggest tormentor in hell? The conscience. The conscience. People's conscience drive them crazy today because they're not living. Oh my gosh, good thing it's water, huh? They're not living in harmony with God's will. And so to alleviate their conscience and the shame and the guilt that they feel, what do they do? See, it was just water. But but they substitute something else, don't they? Alcohol, drugs. Even prescription drugs to relieve you of the guilty anxiety that you feel, right? No. This man, this man is going to be a, uh, the quintessence of a man who is filled with such guilt and shame, and it manifests itself in his rage against God, against the people of God, against the Jews, and against those who were Christians at that time. Make no mistake about that. Do we not live in a society that's hostile to everything we believe now? I'm, I'm, I'm going to be 71 years old. I, I grew up in a different America. I, I grew up when the major institutions of this country could be trusted that they supported the Judeo, Old Testament, Christian, New Testament ideology or, or philosophy of life. The government supported everything we held dear. Is that true today? No. No, the government declares you to be an enemy of the state now. Entertainment industry. You know, Father Knows Best, wonderful Disney, The Sound of Music, all those beautiful films and, and productions that were made. Weren't they wonderful? Affirming what we believe, affirming the values that we hold dear. Do they do that today? It's very difficult to find anything decent to watch, isn't it? That isn't in black and white. <laughs> Yeah. Music? How about the music industry? Entertainment industry, the music industry, the government. Higher education. Surely the educational system is supporting what we believe. No, not at all. Not at all. All of those major institutions that once we trusted can now be trusted any longer. They are hostile to you and I, and they're making it very difficult for our children and grandchildren. Hmm. Any other institutions that you can think of? Medical. Oh, thankfully, we live in this state where now they have legislated the fact that your doctor can prescribe the medicine that you need, whether it's uh, hydrochloroquine, or ivermectin, whatever it might be, uh, for whatever may ail you. But thankfully, we're going to get away from the polarization of our medical system, at least here for now, for the moment. What else? Chris and Dumb, with the emphasis upon the, the UMB, right? The Dumb. Prostate church, the apostate church. Listen, 
Who attacked the early church more than anybody else? The religious of the day, the Jews, the religious Jews. Who's going to attack the true church, the body of Christ, more than anybody else in our day? The apostate church. You're working against the unity that the Spirit is trying to bring. What's well, a different spirit? And it's not the unity that the Bible talks about. Not the unity of the Holy Spirit. Am I lying? No. Be careful. Be very, very careful because it's very seductive. Mm-hmm. Yes, he'll exalt and magnify himself above every God, speaking blasphemies against the God of gods. Who's the God of gods? Jehovah, Jesus, and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished for what has been determined shall be done. Hey, every devil gets there and every saint their reward and so would the Antichrist. Now, he knows, Satan himself knows he has but a limited number of days. He's still not doing what he wants to do. Where is he right now? He's at the throne of God accusing us, right? He's accusing the brethren. Who's our advocate? Who stands on our behalf? Who bears witness of who we really are? Jesus, Jesus. Now the father's going to get fed up with him very soon. I hope it's very, very soon, father. And what's he going to do? He's, he's going to cast him from heaven. Jesus declared in Luke's gospel, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. That hasn't happened yet. That's yet future. Oh, but when it does, Revelation tells us he gets up off the ground after that body slam and he's enraged. He's, he's a Kong on steroids, you know? <laughs> and who does he attack? The Jew and the church. And for a season, for a time, the scriptures tell us he will prevail against the church. He'll prevail against the righteous, but we will overcome. How? The blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, and did not love our life to the end. It's not keeping our life here at all costs. It's living for Jesus no matter what the cost. Have you determined that in your mind? Have you settled that in your heart? That you're going to live for Jesus no matter what the cost? And listen to me. The cost today in the northern neighbor of ours is economic. Isn't it interesting that your treasury minister said one of, one of the ways in which they determine the bank accounts are going to freeze and the funds are going to confiscate are Trump supporters. That's a shock, isn't it? Trump supporters? And who might they be? The majority of Trump supporters. Who might they be? Evangelical Christians. Isn't that amazing? So, so what, what if, what if, what if we run the risk of losing everything that we hold dear in our 401k or whatever you think your dream is of the future and your retirement and this, that, and the other thing, what if that's what it was going to cost you to stand for Jesus? We just still stand. Now, that's the first persecution that's going to come. It's going to be economic. It's going to be financial. So maybe you should be thinking about that and praying and asking God to strengthen you now inwardly in the inner man, woman, Lord, Lord, would you please bring me to the place where you can trust me with the suffering you have purposed for me? That's a different way of looking at it, isn't it? We only mature and are perfected through the sufferings we go through in this life. When has it ever been safe in the last 2,000 years to be a Christian? It's not. not. Every place else, it's not. So I want you to begin to think about the great physician has a prescribed suffering for each of us to help mature and perfect us. Anybody can praise God in the good times, can't they? Anybody can praise God in hallelujah when everything's going exactly the way they want it to go. What happens when everything is a Job experience? Will you still, like Job, be able to find that song in the dark night of the soul? I'm not a life coach. I'm not a positive profession processor. <laughs> I want to tell you the truth. It's my responsibility to prepare myself and to prepare you for what the Bible says is coming. If we are in the time, I think we're in. So spend some time in your prayer closet asking God to prepare you deep down 
for what may come. Peter, that wonderful fisherman that we love, he watched his dear wife be crucified and encouraged her to be faithful. Faithful to the calling he's placed upon your life, my dear. Suffer for him joyously. Wow, that's a different way of looking at it, isn't it? Lord, find me trustworthy for the suffering you have prepared for me, Lord, where I'll still glorify you in all of it, no matter what it may be. Hmm? Yes, this is that seven-year period that's talked about in this verse 36, the reign of the Antichrist. And it's a short seven years, but boy, it sure won't feel like a short seven years, will it? Hmm. He shall regard neither the God of his fathers nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above them all. He shall have no regard for the God of, their, of his fathers. Who's that? It would be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It would be the God Jehovah, or Hashem, as they would say. All right, so he is what by ethnicity? He's at least part Jew. That my, my reckoning is that my interpretation, my understanding, he's at least part Jew. He, not be, he may not be 100% Jewish, but he has no regard for the God of his fathers. So he is obviously Jewish to some extent, nor the desire of women. What does that mean? It could be a double entendre or have a double meaning where he's a homosexual, no desire for women, he likes men. Or... And possibly as well, not just or, but as well, he has no desire for what every young Jewish maiden wanted to bear, the Messiah. That was their hope and their desire. Every, every young maiden would have wanted to be the one to bear the Messiah because he would be born of a woman. And so he's a Jewish homosexual who hates Jesus. Well, that's obvious. We know that from the text as well. Nor regard any God any religion, for he shall magnify himself above them all. He alone is the sole object of worship, and he will demand it. He'll demand that the whole world bow down and worship him as Nebuchadnezzar did when he erected that image of gold 90 feet tall in the plains there in Babylon and demanded that the entire world worship him. He was a type of this man. This man is going to demand worldwide adherence or worship, much like the Caesars did in the time of the early church when you could worship any other god you could worship the gods of the Greeks or you could worship the gods of the Persians you could worship the gods and goddesses of the Romans but you also had to worship Caesar and you displayed your worship of Caesar every year by just taking a pinch of incense and burning it on the altar and worship to Caesar and declaring that Caesar is God the Diversity and tolerance that is exhibited today by the progressives. They worship anything and everything except the one true God. That's the one thing that will not be tolerated, right? <laughs> Verse 38, but in their place, in the place of these other gods, in the place of worshiping the one true God, in their place he shall honor a God of fortresses, a God which his fathers did not know. Nor, no, no, he shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and pleasant things. Who's this? Satan, who gives him his power. This man is going to do what Jesus would not do when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. Satan was willing to give him everything and anything he wanted. And Satan did. He's the ruler of this age. He's the God of this world. And so it was him to give because Adam had forfeited the world, didn't he? Jesus is the one who buys it back with his blood. He's the, he's the, the man who goes through the field and finds a treasure therein and gives all that he has to buy the field for the treasure that lied therein, right? Who's the man? Jesus. The field? The world? The treasure? The church, you. Hmm? Yeah. Verse 39, thus he shall act against the strongest fortresses with a foreign god. Satan himself will empower this man to conquer and to pillage and to destroy which he shall acknowledge and advance his glory, the glory of Satan. He shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. What land are we talking about? Jerusalem. 
The two causes for Gentile judgment by God, where God's wrath is going to be poured out upon the Gentile world more than any other reason, both in the Old Testament declared in Joel, both in the New Testament, Jesus' own words, you've dispersed my people Israel, you've scattered them throughout the nations of the world, and you divided my land. Well, we know the Jews have been scattered, now they're making Aliyah. Who was Christopher Columbus? By ethnicity, he was a Jew. You may not have known that. I was speaking with someone just the other day about that. I had no idea Christopher Columbus was a Jew. He was a, an Italian by nationality. He was a Jew by ethnicity. Who sponsored his trip to the New World? Three very wealthy Jewish merchants. Look at the history. It's all been covered up because of anti-Semitism today. But, but three very wealthy Jewish merchants sponsored the trip. Why? Looking for a safe place for Jewry because of the Inquisition. 1,000 years that machine of death and murder was going on. Can you imagine that? 1,000 years. Torturing people. They torture you long enough. You confess anything, won't you? Yeah. That's what these heretics do with the Bible. <laughs> they torture long enough, it'll confess anything. Hmm. So Christopher found what? And what, what has America been? He was looking for a safe place for Jewry during the diaspora. What has America been? The safest place in the world for the Jew until today. Now there's more Jews in Israel than there are in New York City. You know. Could, is it possible that what happened in John 12 happened here? That the public ministry of Jesus to Israel ended? That the public ministry of Jesus to the United States is over? Look at the anti-Semitism that's spreading within the church today. Christian dumb. Amazing. But God has fulfilled his purposes for America. It was the safest place for his people until today. And now they're making Aliyah. Just as he said they would. When we get into Ezekiel, we'll find some fascinating prophecies there. Yes, they'll divide the land for gain. Verse 40, at that time, at the time of the end, the king of the south, this is Egypt, shall attack him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen and with many ships. He shall enter the glorious, the, he shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. So he's going to make a military campaign to the south. He's going to conquer over Egypt. He shall also enter the glorious land. Was that? Israel. And many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape his hand, Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. Where's that? That's Jordan today. That's Jordan. What, 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 what is so significant about end times prophecy with regard to Jordan? What's in Jordan? Petra, the rock city of Petra. What's happening in Petra? That's where a third of the Jews flee to and are preserved by God. Hmm? The Antichrist will go after him as they flee, but what happens? God causes an earthquake. He swallows them up, as he did with uh, the rebellion in Moses' day, remember? What were those th three boys' names? Those rebels, those princes? Nathan, Abiram, and Dathan, right? And all that they had, and their wives, and their children, swallowed up. Hmm. How many will get swallowed up in their anti-Semitism? And hmm. their rebellion against God? But Jordan will escape. Verse 42, he shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He's going to accomplish his desire there militarily. Verse 43, he shall have power over the treasuries of gold and silver, over all of the precious things of Egypt. Also, the Libyans, the Ethiopians shall follow at his heels. But news from the east and the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go out with fury to destroy and annihilate many. Now, if you uh, have a good understanding of end times prophecy, you know that there's a confederation that's going to come about before what we call the War of Armageddon, right? Two major battles at the very end of time. The first one is the Gog-Magog conflict. We'll read more about that when we get into Ezekiel, particularly the latter portions, 36, 37, 38, 39. That war is comprised of who? Who? The nation surrounded Israel, Psalm 83. But this battle, the primary force behind it is Russia, Gog and Magog, right? And who is with Russia? Persia. Persia. And who's Persia? Iran. Togarma. Who's Togarma? Turkey. Those are the three principal players, Rosh, 
Meshach and Tubal, well, that's Russia, and then, and then Togarma, which is Turkey, and Persia, which is Iran. Iran was always called Persia until 1935, and they changed the name of Persia to Iran. But if you go to Iran today and you talk to Iranians, they say they're Persian. Persian. We're Persians, right? Isn't that amazing? We see what's forming today. You don't hear much about Israel in the news lately, do you? No. You know what the weakness of this present administration is going to bring about? Russia's conquering over Ukraine. China's conquering over. And Iran acquiring a nuclear weapon. Perilous times shall come. Kalepos times. What are those fun times? What's that word, Kalepos? Demonic forces. Demonic. That's what we see happening today. Aren't we glad that God is, oh, God's sovereignty is my sanity. I'd, be, I'd, I'd lay awake at night, wouldn't you? Well, I do that now. After, after here, I got to go do a sleep study. I won't sleep a wink. <laughs> I'll be thinking about that. <laughs> but news from the east. What happens in the east? Revelation 9 tells us what's going to happen. 200 million Chinese cross the Euphrates River and come against the forces of the Antichrist. And where do they converge? In Israel, the plains of Esdraelon. Hmm? Armageddon. Now, when John, listen, when John wrote this, there, were, there weren't 200 million people on the planet. You understand that? The population wasn't 200 million. But he sees an army of 200 million people cross the Euphrates River. Hyperbole? No. Back in the late 90s, there was a Time Magazine article where China had boasted of being able to man a 200 million man army. Did they read the Bible? <laughs> the kings of the East. It's the only explanation for it is the Chinese. Who has armed the Chinese? Who's provided all of the resources they need to be armed to the teeth to now become the number one military force in the world? Who's done this? <laughs> U.S. taxpayers. What's GM? General Motors? Do you know that GM is now CM? How many of you know that GM is now CM? What's CM? China Motors. China Motors. Now, they haven't changed the name. The largest importer of Chinese automobiles in the country is GM. If you buy a Cadillac, it's made in China. China has now a majority stock of all of GM. Did you know that? Who owns Hollywood? China. Who owns the NBA? China. It's unbelievable. Who's done this to us? Have the Chinese done this? Have the Russians done this to us? Who has done this to us that we're in this position? We have. We have. Just as in Jeremiah's day, they had no one to blame for what had happened but themselves. All so unnecessary. All they had to do, all we have to do is submit and obey the Lord. And he brings such beauty and such order, such joy into the life of an individual, into a family, into a marriage, in, into a nation. Look what we've done. We were, we were one nation under God at one time. Not anymore. Not anymore. And who has done this to us? We've done it to ourselves. Just as Israel of old, so too we have. Oh, I'm thankful. Better days are coming. Now, we're going to move into chapter 12 next week, and, and we get to all the way out to the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. 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 <laughs> you looking forward to that? Yeah. I am. I am. Did I finish this? Let me see. But news from the east and the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. And he shall plant his tents of his palace between the seas. Which seas? The Dead Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. And he'll be in the glorious land, Israel. He'll be in Israel and Jerusalem. And yet he shall come to his end. Hallelujah. And no one will help him. <laughs> Who's going to bring him to his end? Jesus, yeah. Now, Daniel has already prophesied in several places where God's kingdom is going to come about. He said in chapter 2, verse 44, and in the days of these kings, he's talking about these successive world-governing empires, the first one being Babylon, then the Medo-Persian, then the Greek, then the 
Rome, and then they revived the Roman Empire. And he says, now, when all of this comes about, because those are the ones that most affected the land of Israel, his, his people, the Jew. He says, when all of this comes about, in the days of these kings, and the last one, the European Union, the God of heaven, not the church. You know what dominion theology is, kingdom now? Yeah. You know what that is? It's a lie. It's not just... <laughs> Just as replacement theology is of the devil, you know where replacement theology is, right? Where, where the church somehow has replaced the promises that God has made to Israel? No, 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 never. Nay. If God was not going to be faithful to Israel, there's no reason for you and I to trust him. Hmm? In the days of these kings, Gabriel told Daniel, the God of heaven will do what? Establish his kingdom. See the flag? Uh, which flag are you under? That one or this one? Now we're over this one temporarily. But if I have to make a choice of allegiance, whether I'm aligned to that flag or that flag, it has to be this one. Right? In the days of those kings, and I think we're living in those days, that the God of heaven is coming to establish his kingdom. We've been praying as a church for 2,000 years. Not us specifically to that, but uh, we're, we're our family. We go all the way back 2,000 years. Our family's been praying for 2,000 years. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And that's precisely what Daniel says. The coming of the kingdom of God. Yeah, next week. Next week, a lot of good news. Amen? Shall we stand? Terry, you got a closing song?